Thank you so much to Nayantara, Bunu, and, and the rest of the Photo Kathmandu team for inviting me to be here as part of the South Asia Incubator Program. It's been such a huge privilege to share this space with you all, and over the last few days, the conversations I've had have been incredibly rich and deeply fascinating, and I've learned so much from the artists and other curators that I've had the opportunity to meet. I think Nayantara asked both Michael and I to talk about aspects of our work that focus on developing artist practice and artist work. So I'm just going to highlight three of the very many ways in which we have kind of been working with um, artists over the last kind of three and a half decades uh, that Autograph has been in existence. And I think it's important to say that what I'm going to present isn't an, a kind of really a big overview of our work. There's, there's lots of facets, and I think it would take a long time to kind of go through the different trajectories and ways that we work, but this is more of an overview of three of the kind of key points, um, and this gives you a sense of how we've been working, what we've been developing. It's a very loose kind of mind map of stuff that I kind of jotted down yesterday, but it was important to add plus many more facets because it is through different conversations that things have developed over the years. Um, so, Autograph was founded by a constituency of um, photographic and lens-based artists of color in 1988. This year we celebrate our 35th kind of anniversary. Um, and it was about addressing this lack of visibility or invisibility, so to speak, within the arts, particularly in the UK, to raise important questions around race, rights, representation, and identity. We are predominantly a making organization, and we see ourselves as a place of experiment and progression with artists that we work with to underpin the work across our artistic program. Our gallery is located in Shoreditch in East London, and that is what our building, a snapshot of our building looks like. Um, and over the years, we've worked with a plethora of artists, including you know, many of which you will recognize, Shahidul Alam, Zarina Bimji, Sunil Gupta, Gideon Mendel, Lyle Ashton Harris, Kalpesh Lithigra, Apita Shah, Zanelli Muholi, Mona Hatoum, Lola Flash, Carla Heary, Ingrid Pollard, Maxine Walker, Dawid Bay, Carrie Mae Weems, Mahini Chandra, Sonal Kantaria, Ada Silvestri, Sutipa Biswas, Ito Barada, Dana Popper, amongst many, many others, and the list kind of continues. Each encounter um, has been very different with each artist, and some of these dialogues that we've had have developed over many years and actually continue to develop after in these different forms. In the photographs I've just shown you, these are obviously exhibitions that came to fruition, but in other cases it may have been through a residency, a commission, and a publication. Over our 35-year history, um, our collection has really been shaped in a very unique way, and we now hold around 5,000 works, photographic works predominantly. And I say unique as we don't acquire work in the same way as other institutions do. Uh, one of the ways in which the collection has developed is through commissioning artists to produce work that reflects our mission and values, which are often then deposited into the collection. And these are just a few of the examples on this slide and the one before. At the moment, we are cataloging the entire collection in, with a view of making it more accessible to a wider audience. Um, and in the case of someone like Ingrid Pollard, in the top left here, it's actually a body of work of five works that were commissioned, but this is just a bit of a highlight to give you a sense. I think where I wanted to begin today is really with this idea of an artist conversation. Over the last few days, many of us have engaged, exchanged, um, and share dialogues with one another. And for us, publishing these conversations or encounters has often been a way, uh, whether in print or online, um, to kind of have these dialogues with artists. And it's followed a long trajectory of conversations that have taken place at Autograph over many years. For me, it's one of the forms of, of work that has shaped my curatorial practice over the last few years. Um, and in March 2020, I think when like many of us, we were faced with the pandemic, Autograph closed its doors, and, but our virtual, our virtual world remained open. Um, we could never have imagined at that point it would have been 18 months before we were get back in the gallery and it was reopened to the public. But over this time, I developed a series of artist conversations 
probing aspects of these artists' works that I was curious with, and Monica, who we heard from so eloquently earlier this week, was one of the first conversations I initiated in this series. It was a really wonderful moment to reconnect with her and her work, having first met one another in 2014, and of course had been in touch sporadically over the years. Um, in 2020, I was part of the Firecracker Photographic Grant Jury, and if you don't know Firecracker, it's a platform run by Fiona Rogers, who's just been appointed the new v &A Curator of Women in Photography in London, um, but she has been running Firecracker since 2010, and it's a platform to support female and non-binary artists through kind of platforming and highlighting practice, but also through grant giving as well. Um, Monica and I spoke in this particular conversation that you see a screenshot of here. We spoke about the development of her practice since I first met her, um, but also at that time her, her project Second Nature was still in development. And we touched upon these kind of ideas of non-visible power structures and the impact of biased thinking, which left a lot of food for thought and opened a sense of urgency in what we could do to support her practice. Since last year, uh, Monica was invited to take part in the uh, annual Autograph Lightwork uh, Residency Program. It's a residency program that's been in existence for Autograph since 1996 with Syracuse, which is a, uh, in Lightwork at Syracuse, which is based in up, upstate New York. And it's a kind of space for a month for an artist to think and maybe make work or develop work or think about kind of outcomes of a particular kind of way in which they're thinking. Um, and Post that residency, we're now working towards a show in 2024 together. But in the end, as you can see, these conversations sometimes do take years to develop. And in the case of Monica and I, if you kind of chart right back to our first encounter, that would have been 10 years or so in the making. So it's a pretty long thread of kind of dialogues and conversation. As the series of conversations have developed, um, they were shaped around encounters with artists or works that I was, I was already kind of interested in, or artists that I may have heard speak in a kind of public program forum, or I was researching into. Um, and it was kind of predominantly themed around artists that were working with the diaspora, the kind of issues that were affecting some of these ideas. And we've heard a lot of, this, a lot of these kind of ideas this week around migration, journey, partition, separation. Um, and it was led by a kind of curiosity to know more beyond the work we were seeing, a way of breaking down perhaps some of the ways in which I was engaging with artist practice and a desire to share this more broadly. These conversations I kind of see as an opportunity to plant small seeds to understand how a practice has been shaped and been formed. Um, so Palomi Basu is one such example. I had the privilege of curating her show at Autograph in spring 2022. But this dialogue with her had almost begun four years prior to that. I first encountered her, new, her then newly published book, Centralia. And over that time, we began conversing and she expressed a desire to develop a more personal work, which resulted in fireflies being kind of born from that moment. Um, just before the pandemic, similar to Monica, she took part in the Lightwork Residency. And post-residency, we staged the first chapter of the conversation, which was called The Enduring Legacies of Women's Trauma. This was really about um, talking through what she was developing during her um, residency, but also the wider dialogues around some of her previous bodies of work. We then kind of staged the second chapter as a public talk at the Photographer's Gallery. The third chapter was published to coincide with the show opening. And then after that, we were invited to speak at Tate Modern as part of the uh, off-print photo fest, uh, off-print book festival um, in London last year, where we then unpacked the role of bookmaking in her practice. So as you begin to kind of trace these different dialogues and lineages in the conversation, you realize it becomes this big repository of dialogue that really echoes a sense of process for both the artist, but also myself, and, and to develop a relationship in a more meaningful and I think sustainable way, which I think is quite important considering where we are with things. Other conversations in the uh, series include uh, artists such as Mariam Wahid, Toby Alexandra Falade, uh, Gisela Torres, but this is also extended into our commissioning program where we engage in conversations with artists as part of their development of their work. So the bottom layer that you see, these are all conversations I had with artists when we were developing the program, Care Contagion, Community Self and Other. 
Um, so talking about commissions, um, we recently completed a series of artist commissions supported by the Bagri Foundation, a nonprofit that supports arts and art practice um, within the kind of South Asian um, uh, space. Um, and through this project, we commissioned three artists that we had never worked with before, um, but had all been in our own way. So between Mark Seely, our director, Renee Musai, our then senior curator, and myself, had been following for many years prior. So Rina Saini Khaled, Lara Altantawi, and Sim Chi Yin. They were invited to produce a new photographic work that responded to a very open brief, but it took into consideration the unfolding global politics. Uh, in relation to migra cl uh, migration, climate crises, freedom of movement, health and well-being, activism, social change, and environmental justice. It was also about weaving in aspects of what they were interested in around memory, work, hope, and futurity, which leads on to kind of two pre pre previous rounds of commissioning, which was connected to the pandemic, so Care Contagion Community, which I mentioned earlier, but also, it was then staged as an exhibition and a publication, which is now part of the Photo Circle Library, um, and Amplify Stranger in the Village, Afro-European Matters, which specifically looked at the impact of Brexit upon the European black community and this idea of journey in that sense. Um, working concurrently on all three commissions provides such a fascinating insight into the way artists think and work in their interpretation of the brief in the case of uh, Sim Chi Yin, who many of you know as a research-led visual artist whose interdisciplinary practice focuses on history, conflict, migration, and memory. And through her work, she often combines photography, moving image, archival interventions, and text-based performance in her multi-layered work. For this particular commission, Chi Yin responded to creating a series called suitcase is a little bit rotten, which was a phrase that her then two-year-old son kind of uttered, and she was interested in this kind of construct of language. Using new and found imagery to speculate on the potentialities of transgenerational memory and inheritance between the artist's socialist grandfather, a political activist in British Malaya who was executed for his politics during the Cold War, and her son, who was born in London at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, resurrects a kind of trace of forgotten um, history, not least by, the, her, great, by her son's great-grandfather, but also through the name that her son inherited. Intervening with an archive of magic lantern slides from the early 1900s as these precarious sites of reimagining photographic time travel, Chi Yin created these fantastical time space visual repertoires uh, that kind of looked at childhood trauma, futurity, and the long legacies of colonial violence. Over the course of the commission, she collected tens of slides that were from eBay and from various other sources. Um, that were looking at and that were worked on and interwoven with fragments. Through the dialogue we were sharing with Chi Yin, using the archive as a precarious site for photographic time travel as a way of bridging a gap. Beyond the curatorial dialogue, we often commission a writer to contextualize the work. And in the case of this series, we decided to work with poets inspired by the Bagri Foundation's program, The Bottom Drawer. Um, it was the first time we had worked with uh, poets in this manner. We normally would commission writers from all different kind of backgrounds, be it academic, scholarly, or more contemporary art dialogue. But in the case of Chi Yin, we commissioned Nina Pals, who configured this really interesting short series of lyrical poems where she was responding to aspects of Chi Yin's work under the title Blue Trees and Other Archival Light Forms. Pals took in, in kind of inspiration from Chi Yin's slides, which drew upon her own Chinese Malaysian heritage and these fragmented memories of familiar fabrics. And fo the photographs emphasize the kind of collective legacies imbued in these uncanny experiences of, of people and places simultaneously familiar and unfamiliar. Whereas with someone like Laura Altantawi, she wanted to develop a new chapter of her extensive series, I'll Die For You, a long-term body of work which explores climate change through the experience of small farming communities. In this particular iteration, she wanted to look further into the mental health impact of Brexit and the pandemic, which has had particular emphasis on the experience of women and the challenges they face today. 
the commission allowed Laura to explore a different direction and gendered focus within this ongoing international project, which incorporated research conducted at the Museum of English Rural Life into materials relating to UK farming and archival documents reflecting the history of political propaganda. For both Chian and Laura, what was really interesting was it pushed their practice in a very different direction. And it was through the commission that they were able to kind of incorporate different forms of strategy or visual making and practice into their work. Um, this was a kind of poetic response by Shagufta Iqbal. Um, I should say that all the commissions are available to view on our website under the commissions banner at the top and including all the writing that I'm kind of talking about today. Um, the third artist, Rina Saini Khaled, was really interested in this idea of what it means to hold a passport and it was kind of being developed at that point when the pandemic kind of closed all borders and you know, no one was able to fly or travel anywhere and she was really looking at the kind of global impact of what it means to have this kind of passport freedom. And so she looked at the kind of uh, markers of which countries allowed the biggest freedom of movement, which is in fact Japan, and then also countries that allowed very little movement. So there's about 28 works in this, and this is only a handful of them, but I think Iran was one of actually the very few countries that would only allow you to travel to very few places. So if you look on the map, you kind of see these global maps and the green means, you know, very distant, very kind of um, open travel, but you'll see as the works kind of progress that the map shrinks and becomes smaller. So this was a way that she was working through archival uh, images that she was sourcing from different news sites, different captions unfolding with dialogues that were also happening at the same time within the news and the media that we were all kind of experiencing and seeing in our own ways. Um, the commissioning project was intended to be a year-long process from invitation to outcome, but due to many reasons that were so beyond anyone's imagination, including COVID, personal circumstances, the process actually took 18 months. And I think that's really important to add that, yes, we're trying to make work, yes, we work towards deadlines, but we're also working with people. And it's really important to have that kind of flexibility to understand um, you know, how that kind of shapes and develops and what an outcome could look like. Um, and this is just a bit of an overview, so you can see what we commissioned. Again, there were artist conversations involved with this. Um, commissioning can often lead to developing exhibitions, um, and has been the case with Sasha Huber, which has formed part of a solo exhibition called You Name It, which is currently still on at Autograph until the 23rd of March, so for anyone that's coming back through London, please do come and visit. It's a really rich exhibition. Um, Sasha's work is focused around notions of healing, colonial wounds, and how one might resist violent histories as a sense of invisibility or visibility in that form as a way of achieving liberation. The works in this exhibition span over 15 years, and it really looks at the way history is imprinted onto the landscape through acts of remembrance that include memorialization, through the naming of place and the erection of monuments. <coughs> Tethered, often tethered to natural spaces, so mountains, lakes, rock formations, glaciers and craters as these contested territories. Her practice has been prompted by the cultural and political activist um, campaign demounting Louis Agassiz to redress the legacy of the Swiss-born glaciologist uh, Louis Agassiz, whose scientific contributions resulted in over 80 landmarks and several animals bearing his name on Earth, Moon, and Mars which is kind of phenomenal when you kind of think that he was writing and researching at the time between 1807 to 1873. Less well known, um, however, was Agassiz's legacy of scientific racism, which is why Sasha is so particularly interested in this. It was an ideology that he had of proving the inferiority of black people. And he commissioned uh, J.T. Zeely, who we now know as this kind of celebrated photographer, to photograph enslaved people on the Edge Hill Plantation in South Carolina in the March of 1850 to further his eugenics campaign. These images are still housed at the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. And at, and up until very recently has been the site of a major lawsuit, which was bought by one of the relatives of, of Rendy Taylor, who was an enslaved and Congolese uh, individual that was photographed by Zili on this plantation. 
so foregrounded in the center of the gallery. And this is really important for this work to have this space where this was this open-ended hexagonal enclave uh, to house the commissions which were titled Tailoring Freedom. It depicted Den Renty and Delia Taylor, an enslaved Congolese father and daughter, whose portraits were forcibly taken by Zili and used by Agassiz. Huber reproduced these portraits um, onto wood and used her signature staple gun method, a technique she's been developing since 2004, which combines both fa facets of her practice, so photography and kind of sculptural working, to dress both Renty and Delia in, so with Renty in a suit worn by Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist, and Delia in a dress worn by Harriet Tubman as a kind of contribution of what these abolitionists did for the history of um, black people in America at that time. Her artworks present this vision for a way we can kind of look at, uh, look tenderly with care and you know, look back at this damage that's been inflicted through trauma as a way of kind of pushing through that pain. And so the staple gun is this very, you know, it's a compressed air staple gun. It's seen as this very violent tool, but she uses it as a way of shooting back at this pain, shooting back at the trauma. And the close-up detail that you see is a portrait of uh, Tilo Frey, who was a Swiss uh, politi first woman, Swiss politician um, appointed in Switzerland when the Swiss gave women the right to vote just, just over 50 years ago. So you can see this long trajectory of ways in which she's been working through some of these ideas. Um, post opening of the show back in November, we uh, were invited by the British Journal of Photography uh, to publish an in-depth conversation. And having worked with her for over the last couple of years through the commission that she did for one of our projects, but also the exhibition, it was so interesting to probe more around her sense of archive and imagery, which is something that when I look through some of the previous interviews and conversations that she's had, is something that she hasn't unpacked that much. And it was an opportunity I took to learn a different facet of her work. And it included a lot about her family history and her, the way in which her Haitian, Swiss, uh, Finnish kind of heritage has influenced a lot of her ways of thinking. Uh, with photographs and methods of her work. And for Sasha, she got the cover of the magazine, and it was a beautifully produced piece of two of the new portraits that she made for the show. Um, you can find the interview on British Journal of Photography's website, which is also free to access. And that's me. Thank you so much. Uh, now, it, okay, that's on. Um, thank you, Binti, for that mm -hmm. wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you, Nayantara, Bunu, um, Nirvana, and the rest of the amazing photo Kathmandu team, um, all the people participating in the incubator program. Um, it's been um, a really amazing week, and I'm excited to continue the conversation. Um, when I go back to New York. Um, and also I want to thank the kind gentleman who swept me back to my hotel on a motorcycle <laughs> to pick up my laptop because we were having a technical issue downloading um, this PowerPoint. So, um, so I work at Aperture. Uh, we are a not-for-profit publisher based in New York. We were founded in 1952, in, actually in San Francisco, by a group of photographers um, writers and thinkers, including Minor White, Dorothea Lang, Nancy and Beaumont Newhall, Barbara Morgan, um, among others. And it was a magazine that was created because that kind of magazine didn't exist at the time. Um, photography wasn't necessarily considered um, a legitimate creative art form at the time. So it was really an artist publication created to create space to talk about photography. And uh, the founders talked a lot about, in the original mission statement, the idea of nurturing a shared community of interest um, for the magazine to be a place for photographers, both professional and amateur and creative people everywhere, to be able to talk to one another. And even though 
you know, that's 70 years ago. I think a lot of the original spirit of the magazine continues to um, in influence what we do today. Um, so the slide up here is just a selection of um, some recent and not so recent issues of the magazine. Um, and together these represent different ways of working thematically. Each issue of the magazine is organized around a theme. And this is an idea, of, the magazine has changed many times over 70 years, as you can imagine. Um, but when we did a relaunch in 2013, the first issue of which is the one at the top left, the left yes, um, it was 2013, so it was a real kind of, you know, Ra ra moment of radical change for the medium, both in terms of how images were produced and how images were distributed. Um, so we were really rethinking what it meant to make a print magazine, and there were even conversations like, do we even need a print magazine? Um, but we decided to really kind of emphasize um, in the magazine through printing, design, and text, and context, um, what a magazine could do that you know you couldn't do um, somewhere else. Um, so these are some of the different themes. Um, so just to go back, we actually we do um, we work a lot with guest editors. Um, so we're very interested in sharing the space that we have with different thinkers, um, artists. Um, institutional collaborators sometimes, and we move in different directions. We have a series of issues that um, focus on different cities, looking at photography through the lens of a different place, like the city uh, image at top right of Los Angeles. Um, guest edited issues by artists, bottom left, which was guest edited by Wolfgang Tillmans on the topic of spirituality. And that was his choice. Um, with the guest editors, we let them just, some, sometimes we'll ask a guest editor, like, we want to do an issue on X. You're like a great thinker in this area. Please collaborate with us. Um, and Susan, I put in Documentary Expanded because we did a wonderful collaboration in 2015 with Magnum Foundation looking at how um, documentarians and socially oriented storytellers were create, using new tools available to them um, to um, create work in a changing environment for, um, for photography and documentary. Um, these are some of the other city issues that we've done, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, um, Delhi, Looking Out, Looking In, which was done with the, in collaboration uh, with Alkazi Foundation and Rahab Alana. Um, Vision and Justice, which I'll talk more about a little later. Um, and a recent issue, Sleepwalking, which was guest edited by Alex Soth. This is our current issue, um, just to give you a sense of what we have out right now. Uh, this, was a, this is an issue called Reference, um, which was originally meant to be an issue um, comprised of people who were not photographers, but really looking at the way the photograph is instrumental in other or adjacent uh, creative practices. So how does a painter use a photograph as influence or reference? How does an architect or how does a fashion designer like Grace Wells Bonner use the photograph as inspiration for her collections and works by photographers from um, James Barner to um, to others have um, influenced her collection. And she's also worked a lot with photographers. So she's really kind of working through this archive of images um, by different photographers of the African diaspora that inform her approach to design. So this was a really compelling conversation with her and the writer Echo Ishan, um, who we work with often. Um, we actually had an interesting problem with this issue where a lot of people didn't want to give up their reference images. So um, that which was interesting how some people were very forthcoming, wanted to open up their process to a public. Some people didn't want to. And so we ended up opening up the issue a little bit and also looking at how artists like Stephanie um, Sajuko um, uses um, images from archives in her work. She's really kind of mining archives um, and uh, archives created by colonial histories. Uh, this is an issue that we did in 2018, I think, called Prison Nation, and this was a collaboration with a scholar named Nicole Fleetwood, who is an expert on looking at the intersections of art and incarceration in the United States. The United States has an appalling um, number of people who are incarcerated, and it is a system that is pretty much invisible if you're not touched immediately by um, 
by incarceration. If you don't know somebody who's incarcerated, it's maybe something that you're not thinking about. So because it was like, it has this question of visibility attached to it, we were thinking about how are photographers working in prisons, how are photographers um, trying to get access to prisons now, and um, so we put together this issue of the magazine, and this has a cover by Sable Lee Smith, who is an artist who, um, she has an ongoing multifaceted project about the US industrial complex, prison industrial complex, and her father is actually serving a life sentence in a prison, and this is actually an excerpt of an artist zine that she created that we kind of adapted for this issue of the magazine. And which I think is, uh, we've met with a number of photographers here working with zines. Um, and so it's interesting to think about how works like that can be adapted for an exhibition, or in this case, a magazine cover. Each issue of the magazine has a mix of different types of pieces. This is an example of a profile. Um, this is a piece on Bruce Jackson, who actually started going to prisons in northern Texas and southern Oklahoma in the 1960s as an ethnomusicologist. He was going to record prison song. He was taking photographs um, basically just you know, for his own kind of um, record, um, but ended up being a photographer over many, many decades investigating um, the prison system in the US. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of these other slides because just to just give you a sense. One, this is an interview with Jesse Crimes. Jesse was incarcerated for a number of years and actually made work in the context of prison. So this is actually a piece that he made using bars of prison-issued soap that he then um, did these image transfers on with newspapers. And he actually snuck these out of the prison um, because it's actually a crime to um, vandalize prison property, which this would have qualified as. He's now released, um, but is very, um, and actually has a really amazing career as an artist now, and um, you know is involved in all sorts of prison activism as well, um, at least we talked about. Um, each issue of the magazine, we are working with younger photographers who we haven't worked with before. Zora Murph is now a star and very visible and um, exhibiting in many places. Um, he was in new photography at MoMA, um, but this was early in his career, and this is a project that he did on an institution, a detention center for, um, for youth. We turned this uh, project into an exhibition, a touring exhibition. It's actually still touring five years later um, to many different cities around the US. Each time it tours, it's partnered with a program um, and it's a program of not just people from the arts, but people from uh, the legal community, prison activists, um, different types of thinkers. Um, so this is our old Aperture space in, in New York, in Chelsea, uh, where we had a six-week um, public program. So we're always thinking the way, how can a magazine be more than a print object, how we can activate it in, into different um, expressions, be it, uh, or forums. Uh, this is a book that came out of the issue. So my main role at Aperture is working on the magazine, um, but I'll do a few books a year. And for me, there are always projects that kind of come directly out of the magazine. I start working with somebody. We want to keep the conversation going. We realize that there's, almost, there's only so much we can do in 10, 12 pages. Um, so this is a project um, from San Quint about an archive at San Quentin Prison um, by the artist Nigel Poor. Um, and it actually started because Nigel was teaching a history of photography class at San Quentin. Um, but she immediately encountered an obstacle, which is that she couldn't bring any books into the prison. Um, so she couldn't bring any photo books in. Um, she was having a hard time figuring out how to show photographs. So she made these Xeroxes, and she led a workshop where she had um, the men she was working with, they would write stories kind of inspired by an image. This is an image by the photographer Joel Sternfeld. So they were always like, you know, kind of canonical pictures. And then on the B side, there would be a mapping of the picture, a kind of close read of the image. Um, in the course of that work, um, somebody working at the prison invited, um, took her to some part of San Quentin and said, hey, we have this archive of photographs you might want to see. They eventually gave it to her, um, and it's, a photo, it's an archive of four, their four by five negatives, um, presumably made by 
one or more corrections officers over a number of years documenting daily life in the prison. Um, often they're you know, evidentiary in nature, evidence of violence, um, but they also show just this amazing, um, you know, eco this, just the li like daily life in the prison. So this is during visitation. Um, and then she was working with the men in her class to interpret the pictures. And obviously, as incarcerated men, they could read things into these pictures that nobody um, or somebody on the outside wouldn't have been able to. Um, Nigel has an amazing podcast called Ear Hustle, which is prison slang for eavesdropping, and it's produced in a media lab at San Quentin, and it's about just telling stories of daily life at the prison. Um, this was an issue that we did called Elements of Style that was really looking at kind of the relationship between codes of dress and identity and photography. And in the process of putting that together, I was... Um, somebody in LA contacted me and said, I just met the son of a really amazing photographer whose work is virtually unknown. And so when we talk about emerging photographers, sometimes for me, an emerging photographer might be 80 years old, like in the case of Kwame Brathwaite, who was at the center of the Black is Beautiful movement in Harlem in the 1960s. And he and his brother, Alambe Brath, created two organizations, one A-Jazz, which was the African Jazz and Art Society. Um, and they were organizing jazz concerts around New York. And um, their whole idea was that jazz needed to come back uptown, that it was like, I guess it was centered in the village and they wanted to bring it back to Harlem and the South Bronx. And um, he also created an organization called the Grandasa Models, which were a kind of modeling troupe um, and collaborations between a modeling troupe and the whole idea was designed to promote a vision of black beauty and black is beautiful. Um, they staged protests against the wig store in Harlem and um, he had this amazing archive of photographs that had never been published. So we did this as an article in the magazine and it was clear immediately like that we were just scratching the surface. We worked with an amazing historian, Tanisha Ford, um, who had written a book called um, Liberated Threads, and it, which was a global history of soul style. And so Tanisha had kind of encountered Kwame's work in that research um, and um, was eager to um, go deeper. And so then we ended up publishing his first monograph, which came out when he was 80. Um, we thought this picture was so good that we couldn't even put any text on it, um, that it was just such a powerful statement in its, on its own, and so it actually has the title of the book on the back, um, and these are just some of the interior spreads to give you a sense of the work. And this is a book that's really structured around the story of the work, so there are different moments, there's, it's divided into three main parts, one about the jazz work, um, one about, um, it's called uh, Think Black, Buy Black, which is about kind of promoting um, economic empowerment in Harlem in the 1960s and making sure um, money spent in the community stayed in the community. Um, and then another on the Grandasa models. Then we um, worked with uh, Kwame's son, um, Kwame Jr., to um, build an exhibition, which has been traveling to many venues now. Um, another, you know, another project that we did was this issue called Orlando, um, which was guest edited with Tilda Swinton, the actor. Um, and this is an issue that kind of takes Virginia Woolf's Orlando, which is a book published in 1928, and it's about a young nobleman living in the era of Queen Elizabeth I, I think. And um, it's a sort of whimsical tale, especially for Virginia Woolf, where Orlando wakes up one day, Orlando's the central character, and has, in a way that's rendered by Wolf as a sort of non-event, has shifted gender. So it's a sort of, um, you know, sort of ahead of its time in thinking about constructions of gender and gender fluidity. Um, so we put together this issue um, where we invited different artists to respond to the text. Um, one was Carmen Wynant, who um, the early editions of Orlando actually had these amazing photographs. And um, so 
um, which are actually, some of them I think are pictures of Vita Sackville West, who was um, Virginia Woolf's lover at the time. The book in many ways was a love letter um, by Virginia Woolf to Vita Sackville West. Um, but we basically just gave the artists, you know, they could, there was a brief, they could go into the book and pull whatever they wanted and make work based on that. Um, Vivian Sasson actually had a body of work that she was developing at Versailles that seemed to fit perfectly. So we approached her about a commission, but she was like, well, I'm kind of already working on something that fits perfectly. So we said, okay, can we just have the first crack at it for publication? Um, and then there are interviews um, in the issue as well. And I'm just gonna speed up because I'm running out of time. Um, and then we also organized a big photo shoot by Micheline Thomas, where she sort of recasts all the characters of Orlando. Um, and uh, this was, we don't normally do production on this level, but this was like a pretty big production with, you know, at a studio with a stylist and um, a, full, a full production. Uh, this we turned into an exhibition as well. This is at the old Aperture Space. Um, this has traveled around. Um, it was recently at CO Berlin. And then um, we ended up working on this book with Vivian um, out of it. Um, and then, uh, this was a project called Native America, which we worked on with um, an artist named Wendy Redstar. Wendy is, um, she, she's a Crow artist and her work centers on Native American life and material culture through imaginative self-portraiture, collage, archival interventions, and site-specific installations. Um, so Wendy's work is actually the image, this annotated archival image on the right. On the left is actually um, an image by the artist Martine Gutierrez from a project she did called Indigenous Woman, which is a fashion magazine where she casts herself. Um, so it's like a full um, fashion magazine um, where she's the star and um, of, uh, of it. Uh, this issue, you know, has a range of projects. Um, when, uh, Wendy works in archives, so there ended up being a lot of archival work in this issue. Uh, this is now turned into an exhibition as well. It's actually opening at Milwaukee next month. Um, but these are some of the other pieces in it. Alan Michelson, uh, Rebecca Belmore, who's a really um, wonderful First Nations artist making performative-based work. Uh, we ended up working on a book with Wendy. This is her first book. Um, you know, we, um, we work closely in collaboration with artists on the book. So this is a book that Wendy really had, um, you know, a strong hand in shaping with us um, in terms of who the writers were going to be, the design, um, and so forth. And then these are some other examples of her work. Um, but one of the things that came out of this project um, was that first image that you saw, or actually if we go back to this, uh, Wendy had a residency at the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, and in the process of going through her, that archive, she actually discovered relatives of hers, and so she's been involved in this project of naming um, unnamed people in the archive. Um, but in the process of working at the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, she encountered the work of an artist um, who's completely unknown named Kimawan Mechawas. Um, Kimowan was a Cree artist from the Cree Nation, um, and he made really exquisite work from the late 90s through his untimely death in 2011. Um, most of the work is based in Polaroid. Um, a lot of it is performative self-portraiture um, about the body. He struggled um, with an illness, a brain tumor, that eventually took his life at 47 in 2011. And um, he was also... Um, he, a lot, many of the self-portraits have this kind of, you know, uh, extended hairpiece. Um, and uh, so he's playing with ideas of nativeness, but also when he was having surgeries, he himself actually had beautiful long hair. And at one of his surgeries, he asked if he could keep the hair that they were going to have to, they had to shave his head, um, but they had actually incinerated it. Um, so then he started making this work um, with this elongated hair. Um, but he often used his photographs to make these mixed media collages um, and multimedia pieces. Um, so this was a, this is a similar thing with Kwame, where we were thinking, okay, this is an amazing body of work that really needs to be better known. 
Um, so we made a book, and I'm just going to play. We made this trailer for the book. Also, I want to, um, whoops, where's my cursor? Oh, it's over here. Sorry, I'm getting confused by all these screens. Um, you know, I, especially for, you know, the, the, uh, the artist and the incubator, you know, we talk a lot about locating your work and often for applications or for a gallery context, it's the artist statement that becomes so essential. And I think Kim Awan had maybe the most incredible artist statement that I've ever read. Um, and so we made this um, trailer for the book where Wendy Redstar reads um, Kim Awan's artist statement. So if I can find my cursor, we can, okay. I've watched my grandfather anoint the house with sweet breast milk, protecting us from harm, cleansing our home. Crawled city streets at three in the morning, searching for someone to rob, been blessed with a name that only spirits can give. Talked with my mother through a prison glass window, your Armani, punched in at nine, even though I was up until four, tending a sweat lodge fire, ate dog, sold acid. Stayed away from home too long. Wanted to wear my memories like a warm blanket. Shook them off like blood. Gap clothes, greasy hair. Pagan, urbane, living in a nation of ghosts. A crime has occurred. I'm combing the clues out of my hair. A burglar has etched a story on my lips. They are little words frail, marching into battle, like eulogies in stone. Someone has called a morning search, a posse, a search party looking for the body, consult the psychic. A Lakota medicine man looks into his hat and sees the transgression, but not the details. The crime doesn't count. It's about the investigation, the trauma, the loss, the aftermath. Okay, I mean, I'm just gonna start with actually just this last bit over here, Michael. Um, and you know, you just said that um, is, this was the artist statement that was read out through the piece, was it? Yeah, exactly. Right, so, and, and you know, we have been thinking a lot about sort of how to create programs and ecosystems that nurture um, and also open up opportunities. So for somebody um, who does what you do, um, what stood out for you in this artist, artist statement? What is a good artist statement? What are you looking for? You know? That is a great question. I think with Kim Owan's artist statement, it, well, he, was in a, he was, had the advantage of being an amazing writer. And in addition to a visual artist, like there's an essay that we republished um, in the book as well that he wrote. Um, I think there's just, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because I think his, his style of an artist statement, I think probably wouldn't have helped him in, for, for, for a long time. Because I think there was a kind of style that people maybe had to present their work in a certain way, like frame it in relation to something or kind of situate it in a, in a body of thought, where his, he, it's like a prose piece that describes the ideas that animate his work. Um, so I think I was drawn to it just because it was such a kind of um, powerful and clear um, and poetic um, art articulation of the concerns embedded in the work. Right. Um, something I've been thinking about is, you know, issues and challenges around representation, um, presenting yourself, um, identity first, um, issue slash concern first, um, you know, the, the incredible challenges of trying to figure it out um, in terms of who you're pitching to, in terms of audiences you're trying to speak to. Um, and I think... A lot of this has also come up in conversation throughout the week um, um, in the in the incubator program. Um, 
Bindi, I mean, you know, you are an artist yourself also. Um, I'm just curious how, A, you've arrived at this work that you do um, at the moment, which is both an artistic practice as well as a curatorial practice, um, and B, how you negotiate sort of um, to be, A, on the speaking side of things, like your own work, through your own work, and be on the receiving side of things, um, receiving work um, of artists who are from diverse backgrounds, um, how you think about sort of issues around identity and representation? I guess um, for me as an, as an artist, my practice has really shifted in the last decade, you know, from where I remember coming out of my um, BA degree in London to where I am now, that artist statement has continuously kind of adapted and been changed, which I think is only healthy because my experiences have changed. What I'm interested in has changed. You know, I, I was speaking to Saurav yesterday and he was like, I just joined the dots that you might have been the same Bindi that I knew as an artist and now you're a curator here. So it's, it's one of those ones that actually for a long time I never spoke about my artistic practice in a, in a setting like this, I very much kept it separate. And that was, I think, through insecurity of not wanting to overstep a mark as an artist in this kind of domain where I've been invited for a very specific thing. But then also on the flip side, not wanting to take advantage of a situation. And so for a long time, I didn't talk about it. It's, I, I think it's only in the last year and a half that I've really begun to see actually how embedded those practices are together. The things that I'm researching into as a curator, I'm actually also thinking about in my work as well as an artist and how I'm developing these voices and ways through. Um, I think the artist statement is a tricky one and I think um, Kimawans is a very unique way of approaching that and actually really refreshing to even hear that. I, had a, I haven't encountered that before. And I think it shows that this kind of, I guess what we've been so used to is what forms are you using? What kind of typography are you, a, you know, it came up, you know, a lot during this incubator. Can I be a photographer? Can I be an illustrator? Can I use painting? And then you kind of end up doing this kind of word vomit of stuff and your bio doesn't become about what you're interested in. It becomes in about what processes you're using and where you've shown and where you've been. And I, yes, there has to be a bit of a balance on that, but I think it's an interesting take on it. I think at Autograph, when we're trying to work with artists, we actually often end up working with them and rewriting their biographies because they often miss out the essence of what their practice is. So with someone like Lara El Tantawi, who's a phenomenal photographer, and she makes books and she's doing all of these different things. But the first sentence of her bio wasn't about her work, it was about the accolades. And so we really tried to work with artists about slightly reframing that to em emphasize that kind of depth in their work in the best way we can. It's a tricky balance though. I mean, I don't think there's one right, right or wrong way. I think everyone's approach is so different. There was this interesting thing that we did at the beginning of our kind of presentations on the first day and, and Lucy was, was someone that was saying that there's a very different way you can kind of introduce yourself that's not about who you are and what you do, it's about who you are as an individual and where you're located in that. And be it through, you know, it could be through your heritage, it could be through your name, what that means. And that was, I think, a really, again, refreshing way of thinking about it. Did you want to add anything? Uh, well, I think to the, I think Kim on just to your point about, like, people who have practices that are expansive that way, I think, um, yeah, I mean, Kim on I think, is a great example, too, of, you know, he, he's sort of medium agnostic. Mm. Like the work is grounded in photography, but a lot of it, you know, is, is um, you know, silkscreen or um, painting. Um, there isn't, photography kind of drives everything. It's the core and actually the kind of spine of the book is um, he had a Polaroid archive mm -hmm. and he took the Polaroids and it was basically that he wanted to create his own car archive of references in a way um, that you know, there were works in their own right, but then he would use them to um, to produce other works. And and I think that was because he didn't want to, um, 
he didn't want to rely on, he talks about this too, he didn't want to rely on existing images. It was like, he was like a complete world builder in that sense. I was actually, if we had had more time, I was going to show another book that we just finished with an artist named A. Walerescu, who we've worked with a lot. You actually saw a picture of his on the cover of the Vision and Justice issue. It was the orange cover. Um, it's a girl with a flat top. Um, but a, we just did this book with AWOL, and just to think about like the, you know, we've been ta working with photographers this week about, um, you know, how long does it take to develop a project? And AWOL is somebody, he, so he's a photographer, and he, well, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. He's not a photographer. <laughs> um, he is a, a multimedia artist. He's, he works with whatever medium makes sense for what he needs to do. And um, I think he's a great example of somebody who just explodes categories in his work, like formal categories. And he talks about how he had, he went to, um, so he's originally from Ethiopia, he grew up in the Bronx, um, went to Cooper Union, studied um, photography there, and ended up going to the Yale MFA in photography, which is like a very prestigious photography program, and is often known for being like very photography with a capital P. And, um, but when he got there, he didn't really want to make photography. And, you know, he was making painting and making sculpture. But it's all linked around a set of ideas and a set of concerns. And so he's also, he's somebody who's medium agnostic, but he's also somebody who's contextually agnostic. And so he will make work in commercial contexts. Um, you've actually, a lot of you have probably seen his work because he made, um, Beyonce's pregnancy announcement photograph where she's perched on uh, a Porsche that's covered <laughs> in beautiful flowers. And, but he'll take an image like that, not that image because um, you can't re easily reuse a picture like that, which we learned recently when we were working on the book. Um, but he makes a lot of images for, um, for publications, and his uh, his thing is that he'll only take assignments if it's somebody he wants to photograph. And he says he talks about how he wants to make. Um, he said that this is a quote of his regal images of black people, and so if it's somebody he wants to connect with, he'll take it. Um, so he has like amazing pictures of a lot of really famous people like Pharrell or DMX, um, Nipsey Hussle when he was still alive, like a lot of people in the hip hop community, and. But so when we were putting together the book, it was it's kind of an unusual mix for us. Um, but it's great because I love that you can flip the page and it might be a picture of Pharrell and then it's a still life. And but the thing is, that it's it's all very carefully calibrated, so it doesn't um, it doesn't feel jarring. I don't think like you can see that it's a unified practice at the end of the day, even if he's you know making an image for a magazine putting that on the wall of a museum, putting it on the wall of a gallery. Um, and I think it's, you know, so I think a lot of those kind of categories and like, you know, I've heard, we've talked about this a lot in the incubator, like these boxes that Peter, people are put in, uh, either boxes of identity or formal boxes. Um, he kind of just explodes them all. So I'm very excited for this book and it has a, a cover with, um, I think it's the first time Aperture has definitely ever had a photography book with a cover featuring um, a Nefertiti shaped disco ball, nice. which is a sculpture of his. <laughs> um, yeah, this whole week we've talked a lot about um, ecosystems. I think these, these are words that we've been using and community and, um, and we've actually received um, many compliments, uh, which we are very um, appreciative of. Um, but earlier today, I was actually having a conversation with somebody who said to me that um, they feel a bit left out. Um, they're here, and they're new to the scene, or so to speak, and um, they don't know so many people here, and they're feeling a bit left out, um, which makes really me think, right, about yeah, one tries, but there are gaps, and 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 what can um, one do to just a firstly be aware of them, um, and be and then be sort of act upon them. Um, so you know, and and some of if if you don't go to Union Cooper or mm -hmm. Cooper Union, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. sorry, um, or to the Yale MFA or to. Um, any one of these institutions. Um, and if you're not, you know, like even, you know, w this past week, I was realizing, um, and I think this is an, 
I mean, it shouldn't have been a new realization for me, I think, but I was realizing that obviously um, maybe some of you are also part of an ecosystem and are used to working together and resources flow in a certain direction and things happen easier when you do belong to a certain network, etc. I wonder if you could speak to a, a, a little bit to um, strategies or, you know, um, things that you would have would like to do but um, feel challenged um, and unable to do due to institutional mechanisms or bureaucracy or resource um, gaps at large or time issues I don't know you know so um, if you could yeah. speak to some of that maybe I mean I guess for us we work across so many different strands like constantly kind of negotiating with ourselves around our kind of exhibition program at the gallery, but also the sheer amount of loans and touring shows that we do. And bearing in mind, our team is, is tiny. Like right now, in terms of the artistic program, there is Mark and myself, so there's two of us. That's it in, in terms of curatorial. So when you think that we work across the commissions, the kind of website development in terms of conversations with artists, um, the exhibition program and all these other facets, Time is this one very beautiful thing in that sense that we just don't have enough of to really, you know, what would be great is to really pause and stop and think and have more encounters like this. This has been a really enriching experience for me to be here and, you know, really reconnect with some artists that I may have been following, curators that I might have encountered the work of, but have not had the opportunity to meet in person. And this has been such a great, very warm and welcoming community kind of feeling I've gotten being here and I just wish there was more time for it you know it's been yes intense we use that word a lot but actually in a very enriching way and I think for me I would want more time to really spend here with people and really kind of get to know them rather than being this kind of fleeting visit not knowing when the next encounter might be yes conversations can continue but it's that time I think has been quite special in that way yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Like, um, and, you know, I think that, I think that kind of, um, I feel like even since I, I've been working, like the, just even like what it means to have an MFA, mm -hmm. like, I, I don't know, I feel like in some ways it's less important. I feel like there was a moment where everyone was like, like you know, this idea, this professionalization of, um, of, of artists, um, like, I feel like it reached this apex at a certain point, and then maybe it's, you know, not to say art school isn't like a great thing and uh, really important for for some people, but maybe it's not the only way it's to be changing. an artist. It's changing, yeah. and um, and also, you know, in you know, in in the states, it's like people, it's expensive, mm -hmm. and people go into debt, and um, so I do think, um, you know, it's something we think about a lot. Is you know. Yeah, I think you're you're right because like these kind of um, networks emerge, but then you know it's about how do you continually kind of build the network, and you know, for us like I think it's different projects that help do that. Like some of these city focused issues, imperfect as they are, as like a structure for for a magazine, like the idea is that they hopefully produce an interesting issue of the magazine that introduces our readers to a lot of ideas and artists. Um, that they don't know and things they haven't thought about before. But what really interests me is like, what's the long tail of those, uh, of those issues and how do you kind of nurture that, um, you know, that network that you're trying to build. Um, and, you know, like the magazine at Aperture vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the programming, it is in a lot of ways the kind of, um, sometimes we call it the incubator too. Um, so it's where a lot of ideas start and a lot of relationships begin. And then I feel like our, our job is to nurture them. And our job is to look and connect with people who aren't necessarily representing specific established mm. institutions. I think that's a really good point, actually. I mean, you know, a lot of the artists that we worked with over the years has often been their first commission, their first show. So someone like Carrie Mae Weems, who's now celebrated as this, an incredible artist, her first show was in Brixton in a cafe in London that Autograph organized, and this is way before we had our gallery space. So that's a really interesting turn when you watch an artist practice develop, where it's going to, where it's shifted to. And I think similar to you guys, we're always at this kind of, because we've been 
an agency as opposed to a gallery for a long time, some of those ways of working have really influenced how we program, who we work with. You know, there was an artist that we wanted to work with who was on, just on the cusp of kind of flying in that sense, and we kind of said, you know what, they, we, they, we know they're on that trajectory. Our support isn't actually needed in this space. Who else can we work with? Who else haven't we worked with? And so we're constantly, similar to you guys, thinking about that through what we're doing. And I think an opportunity like this enables us to know what's happening here and then to make these connections, you know, with yourself, Nayantara, the Nepal Picture Library, to see what you're doing there, and to think about how we might be able to deploy some of those resource, resources in order to help kind of spread what you're doing here, spread the work of the artists that we've encountered. There's lots of kind of different ways, I guess, which is different from a magazine format that we do. We're kind of limited sometimes by space and program and all of that, but we'll, you know, we always try our best to kind of think about ways in which we can open those conversations. And it might not even be with autograph. It could be even an introduction to another space or, or kind of program that we think could be beneficial. You know, I've spoken to a few of the artists that were part of the incubator program and were suggesting residency things like the Delfina Foundation or, you know, Gasworks, who are doing these incredible programs that actually a lot of the artists that we've met would qualify for. They meet a lot of the criteria and they meet a lot of the, the ideas and these kind of ecologies that they're interested in. So why not kind of connect them in that kind of shape and form? Yeah. Let's open it up. Um, if if folks have questions, I mean, I could go on, uh, but you know, we also haven't, even though we've had a few meals together, we also have um, conversations left to be had, but if anyone has questions or thoughts for Bindi on Michael. <laughs> it's okay, I know yeah. it's been a yeah. long week. <laughs> it's been a long week. No, just to say that, you know, um, I think as we're building this program also, the incubator program, I mean, it's really with the intention of trying to, um, you know, you, your work and your sort of networks, more largely, of course, you work with many networks, I'm sure, but um, you are located in a particular part of the world, which honestly to me feels <laughs> quite far away, <laughs> I, I was saying to you the other day. And, and so actually to be able to, you know, spend, like sit up here um, and spend time together is very valuable. Um, everyone's busy, the world is moving, but how to m create more intentional um, sort of efforts to to create more space, to include more people. You know, even though we are trying to do that with this program here, there are, of course, so many people who we couldn't invite into the program. Also, um, how do we continue to sort of nurture space on an ongoing basis? Um, how to think of, um, who said this to me? Some earlier today, Bunu said that, Sorab said. <laughs> <laughs> Game to of her, <laughs> <laughs> that um, that that we're kind of in it also in for the long run, you know. Yeah. And so thinking about timelines, you know, and thinking about what we want. The world is so so ready to pounce on you. To there's so much pressure, and you were speaking earlier about insecurities. And, yeah. Mm. Well, I also think um, there is this pressure to like make work, to publish, to get your work out there. And I think it's really amplified on social media, mm. like where there's this audience for everything. And we did a book with the artist Dina Lawson, and um, it's you know she could have had a book years before it came out. We published it, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, and uh, it has forty pictures. And it's her first book, and I don't know how many years of work, or you know, it's probably, you know, over a decade or more of work, and it's just like this distilled gem because it's just made with such care. Mm. And we always call it the slow and steady wins the race model because mm. it's like, you know, I feel like there's this amazing thing happening with photography books now. Like it's this amazing, huge ecosystem and people can self-publish. Like they don't need Aperture to come and say, let's do a book. And we've responded to that by creating systems for 
um, responding to what's happening with bookmaking. We have a part of the magazine called the Photo Book Review. We publish book reviews. We do interviews with bookmakers. Um, so, you know, so so that. I think gives people many other opportunities aside from a publisher, and we try to amplify people who are doing independent publishing, you know, on the platform that we have. But I do think there is something to be said for just like taking your time that way. Um, the other book I was going to show by Awal that was also it's ten years of work, mm -hmm. and you know he we've published him in the magazine a couple of times, and you know I'd asked him you know hey maybe we should think about a book, and he was like I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And then one day he was like, I think I'm ready. Like, let's, let's do this. And um, I think we live in a moment where that idea maybe isn't always mm. um, supported. Mm. Yeah, I'm all for the long arc, I but I also, too. just a quick so. thing to say <laughs> that I'm also, the, the long arc is telling us it's <laughs> now time to go. <laughs> Yes. Um, but just to quickly say that, you know, I, I'm also aware of the fact that sometimes the long arc requires stamina, requires res yeah. resources. Totally um, it requires people to, you know, as much as we might want to romanticize the, you know, quiet, struggling, mm -hmm. artistic life, um, it's hard to live that. And, yes. you know, you have families and reality kicks in and you might end up becoming a banker um, to I get think, by, yeah. you know? I mean, I work full time and I practice as well. And I had a conversation earlier with one of, you know, the artists that we're working with this week. And it's like, how do I do both? And it's, there are ways. And you all do this kind of juggle. You, the bio you introduced, I have three different hats plus more. And it's like, everyone is constantly doing this juggle. You're kind of trying to find your way through it to give time to different things. And I think, it's okay to take your time with making work because I think that experience gets richer as it kind of develops. I think I said to a lot of you this morning when we met is like, why don't you just take a pause? Why don't you take two, three weeks off from really thinking about this work and just do something else, you know, go and see something else. Don't just focus on this because just adding more because you think it needs more, or you think it needs to be this isn't going to enrich it right now. You just need that distance to really think about what that next step could be for you. And only you know because you're the closest person to the work. And I really encourage that. That longer time is, is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we you touched upon it earlier and just these issues around social media and pressure and insecurities and you know thinking about the long arc through all of those pressures um it's tough right it's tough. It's, it's um and then there are also i mean i don't know what to call them other than trends maybe but you know sometimes it's like hot to be talking about care and so mm. therefore you're just talking about care and sometimes it's hot to be you know like there are many things right like it's it, it there can be seasonal things and so then how these things impact us and and um also create some kind of system of, of or like yeah like a a structure of of pressure also and etc and shape our own thinking so i mean these are certainly conversations that we hope to keep going you know by by inviting you guys i mean um you know we're attempting to do the the long the the long arc work of continuing to try to open doors and create encounters and create time and space even if they're li little intense pockets here and there um by no you know something i am also aware of is um by inviting michael from new york and bindi from london are we creating aspirations for all of us here to just constantly be aiming to pitch to you, you know, across the oceans there, and is that what it takes to make it, you know, or or be seen or be visible? I mean, these are all things that I think we do need to be intentional about and aware about, and sort of act in specific ways. Earlier in the in the wrap up meeting, we were talking about possibly inviting you guys to do stuff here or anywhere for that matter, you know, and in in Colombo or in Dhaka or um and so so how sort of mobility um artist mobility but also sort of mobility of resources and and being in the world um 
is possible in many ways and making is possible in many ways as well. Um, but since it's um, a super enthusiastic for drinks crowd that we have here. Um, we will wrap up and we will say thank you thank to both you. of you for being here.